Hello, people of the internet. My name is Robert Ham. Um, you may or may not know who I am. I'm a uh, arts and culture journalist and critic by trade, um, but have also been moving into the world of buying and reselling uh, used records. Something we can talk about at the end of the video, but where you can find my stuff uh, here in Portland, Oregon, where I live. Um, but you can find me on Discogs. We'll get all that all at the end. Um, I have been inspired by the folks in the vinyl community making videos, uh, particularly folks like uh, Martin's Vinyl, uh, Telegram Sam, and of course Noble Records, one of the bigger ones around uh, folks who are sharing. Uh, yeah, little details about their collection, stuff that they picked up, uh, stuff they're looking for, that kind of thing. Um, so I thought I'd make my first video here. Uh, and go back to, hoping that late to the game on this, uh, uh, a series, a meme, is it going to call it a meme? Um, I don't know what I'm looking for here. Uh, sort of a theme of videos that people have been doing where they talk about the most valuable records in their collection. And I thought this would be a good way to introduce myself to part of the vinyl community as a collector and music lover. Uh, to get a sense of what my tastes are as a record collector and listener. They can get a sense of that a bit with uh, some of the stuff that's behind me here in my music library. I see some of the titles back there. Um, yeah, so I thought we would do that. Uh, hope you don't mind the bushy beard. It's not staying forever. I'm doing growing this part out for a Halloween costume, and this just kind of came with it. So once I, uh, after the 31st, all of this is going to go away. Shall we begin? Let's. So this is the top 30 most valuable records in my collection. This according, again, to as always, to Discogs. Is, uh, Discogs? Is that how you say that? <laughs> to how Discogs uh, has the prices set on there for what people have paid for their records. Um, I am not going to mention what they're worth according to Discogs. If you want to do that on your own, that's fine. That makes me feel a little awkward somehow, especially once we get to the number one record, which uh, yeah, we can talk about when we get to. But, uh, yeah, I don't want to get into what people are asking for this or what the median value of that is according to Discogs or, you know, their metrics. So look it up if you want. I'm not going to talk about it. But, uh, yeah, let's get into it, shall we? Number 30. This is the uh, Tinder 6 album, Simple Pleasures. Simple Pleasure, excuse me. Um, from... Looking at the data back from 1999 on Island Records. This is a uh, simply vinyl, limited uh, vinyl release of the record, uh, which I've covered up uh, for, you know, there's nudity on the cover for Prana Love. This is YouTube. We don't do that here. Um, yeah, fantastic record uh, as the band has started to get into much more uh, R&B soul direction with their music. Um, I don't know if you know Tender Sticks, great British uh, band, sort of came in the vein of um, sort of woozy groups like the... Uh, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds at American Music Club, but with the uh, fantastic uh, lead vocalist Stuart Sutcliffe and lyric writer, and yeah, one of my favorite records of theirs. And stoked about this. Uh, not long after it came out of the Tower Records in Beaverton, Oregon, that is no longer there, as all Tower Records are no longer here in the States anyway. Number 29, The Replacements, Live and Drunk, a bootleg of the band playing live and, yes, drunk, which I know is a bit of a, you know, you could make that statement about a lot of their concerts up until around the uh, mid-90s, uh, the uh, All Shook Down era. But this was them in full bore, drunken, buffoon mode, uh, doing, you know, completely rattly, weird versions of their own songs and a lot of covers on here, as you can see. This goes on for a while. The covers, like... They get through a verse and a chorus before the whole thing starts falling apart, but it's a blast to listen to. I think I found this at Music Millennium here. I think the $10 price tag kind of gives that away. Uh, yeah, really fun. Listen if you're a Replacements fan. You know, you can probably find that in, some of that on YouTube. But track it down, otherwise. Number 28. Oh, Silver Apples. Who doesn't love the Silver Apples? Incredible electronic, psychedelic music from the late 60s. Um, this is an original on Cap Records, as you can see. Um, records not in the, I mean, this, you know, with some of these, the, the value of my copy is probably going to be a lot less than the median on Discogs, part of the reason I'm not mentioning the price. Uh, as you can see, the back of the sleeve's a little 
wonky with ring wear and wear on the edges, but uh, it still sounds great. Um, it only cost me a quarter at a thrift store in Astoria, Oregon, so thanks to whoever donated this one away. And I remember purchasing, purchasing this, reading the lyrics in the back, going, well, this has got to be some goofy, psychedelic, you know, hippie record. But, uh, boy, was I wrong. This dark, weird shit, and I love it. Where are we at here? Number 27, I think? I'll look at my list here on my computer. Yeah, number 27, the first, I think this is the first EP by Char Charlotte Dos Santos, called Clio. Um, really wonderful neo-soul music. Uh, this was uh, a gracious little gift from the uh, gentleman behind the label, Fresh Selects. Shout out to Kenny Fresh. Uh, yeah, if you like uh, Erica Badu, uh, Lauren Hill, the uh, internet, Sid, and Steve Lacey, that whole vibe, I think you'd really dig this record. I think Charlotte has another album uh, forthcoming, so keep an eye out for Charlotte Dos Santos. Number 26, uh, Moss Funky Soul, a compilation uh, that I believe only came out in Colombia, at least that's where... This one was pressed, and that's where I bought this record on a work trip to Colombia. Um, give you a sense of who and what is on this record, including that fantastic illustration right there. Yeah, uh, it's 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 funky, it's soulful. There's more of it. Moss Funky Soul. Uh, again, this is one that I'm not sure the median uh, price in discounts. I think it's still like a hundred bucks because of. Um, only one copy that sold on there, and God knows about this one because it's a, you know, the pressing plants in Colombia weren't great, so this doesn't sound perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, you know, when you're having a hang out with friends and throw this on to set the mood, can't go wrong. Really wonderful record. Let's see where are we at number twenty-five, right? Yeah, one of my all-time favorites, Screamadelica, the third album by Primal Scream, third or fourth album by Primal Scream, and they made that huge jump into more electronic and danceable textures and, and beats and rhythms, including uh, the wonderful Come Together, Moving On Up, their cover of the 13th Floor Elevator's Trip Inside This House, Slip Inside This House, uh, Loaded, the Andrew Weatherall remix of uh, one of their songs, the title which is escaping me right now. Uh, this was, uh, yeah, a pickup at uh, Turn, Turn, Turn. If you're a Portlander, you might know it. Uh, if you're not, a great little venue, bar, record store here in Portland. It's been around for a few years. Uh, former owner had this on the back wall for, you know, a good amount of money, but worth it, in my opinion. So happy I have an original vinyl pressing of that one. Number 24. I don't know if you know this group, the American Analog Set. Yeah fun of watching fireworks. Uh, I think these guys are Texans. At least this came out on Emperor Jones Records, which I believe is a, te it's a Texas label. Yeah, Austin label. Uh, Trance Syndicate, which is uh, a label I think started by King Coffee of Bottle Surfers. Um, really wonderful um, modern psychedelic. Uh, Drony is all get out. A lot of Farfisa, a lot of Moog on here. Um, motoric rhythms and just beautiful pop textures as well. Um, highly recommend it if you don't know this record. Um, surprised it was as valuable as it is, but apparently a lot of people either know this record or those who do know what this is. This is really worth listening to. This was a bit of a surprise coming in at number 23. Clara Rockmore's Theremin. Clara Rockmore, the virtuoso on the theremin. If you've seen the documentary about Leon Theremin, she features prominently in it. Uh, and this is her playing uh, a lot of classical pieces. Rachmaninoff. Um, what else we got here? Yeah, Rachmaninoff, Salsen, Stravinsky, Tchaikovsky, uh, and some more, uh, some rarer stuff that I don't, uh, composers I'm not familiar with. But uh, yeah, a bit of a surprise this one, considering I bought this for very little money. I don't I'm going to say that a bunch to this whole thing because I'm a bit of a cheapskate when it comes to buying records at times, but um, this one, yeah, I think I bought for, you know, $3 or less, and uh, it's worth quite a bit more now, uh, which is cool uh, and amazing. If you like theremin music and classical, this is a, a lovely thing to put on in the background or to throw into an ambient mix. Number 22. This one is Metallica's Master of Puppets, one of the classics of thrash metal. Uh, I think this one ticks a little higher in value because it is the 
Music for Nations, um, ooh, almost dropped it there, Music for Nations double LP, uh, 45 RPM pressing of it. I am quite sure my copy is a lot less valuable than most because uh, whoever previously owned this one, so I bought this used, whoever previously owned this one uh, did this stupid thing, which was to tape the album cover to their wall. Uh, and so when it was removed, they had to take the tape off of it to fold it back together and resell it, or however this happened, but, you know, as you can see, it damaged all over the sleeve, which sucks, but whatever. The record still sounds amazing, as you probably know, Metallica. Uh, in the American Analog set, Modern Psychedelia Vein, this is number 21. Number 21 broadcasts Ha Ha Sound, their third LP. Um, yeah, an amazing, as I said, modern psychedelic bands, uh, very influenced by the crowd rock and, uh, European cinema soundtracks like Valerie and Her Week of Wonders is, features prominently the melody from that one on here. Um, really amazing record. It's just a shame, uh, that they're not making music anymore because the, uh, Trish Keenan, who was the vocalist and co-founder of the band, uh, passed away. But five, six years after this record came out, uh, due to like a swine flu epidemic that, that kicked through the UK and and uh, exacerbated some some previous conditions that she had and took her life. But I'm a huge fan of this group. I'm so lucky that I get to see them live a few times, and it's just mind blowing, mind melting, weird and beautiful, beautiful music. Highly recommend it. All right, here, get into the top twenty here. Between those hotels in the airplane over the sea. I think it was a gift from my lovely wife and my son, who and my wife is in the other room there, so I'm pointing that way. Um, you know, Merge Records release, original Merge Records release, everyone knows this. It's like one of the quintessential indie rock records of all time. Don't need to really get into that one. But I will get into number 18, or sorry, number 19, which is uh, Opal's Happy Nightmare Baby. Um, you will know most of the players on here. This, this band evolved into Mazzy Star after vocalist Kendra Smith here left the group unceremoniously, I think in the middle of a tour, and David Roback, who helped co-write all the songs on here, uh, found another vocalist, uh, Hope Sandoval was her name, and she took over, and then they eventually evolved into Mazzy Star and became the massive successes that they are. And as great as like, the first few Mazzy Star records are, this one I think is even better because it gets in a much darker, seamier, sexier territory. Um, and this is, yeah, one of the original pressings on, uh, For Good or For Ill on SST Records. Um, if you want to know what I mean by For Good or For Ill, read the, uh, book Corporate Rock Sucks that Jim Ruland wrote and just came out, uh, probably a few months back. Uh, we're at number 18, John Renborn, another Monday. Um, original UK pressing of this one, um, this one probably in better, it's like the sleeve being in better condition probably means the value would be great, but um, as you see, the sleeve is a bit of a mess. Um, but that's why, well, I will say, so I got this, so this is another one I got for a pittance because the person who's selling it, this is, uh, if you know Portland and you might know Crossroad Re Crossroads Records, where I actually have a table, um, they were in the midst of moving locations from Hawthorne to Foster, where they're at now, and the dealer at the time um, marked everything on their table down to 90% to help clear it out so you'd have to move a ton of stuff. And so this $10 record became a $1 record, and it's uh, worth a bit more than that. This record's got some moments on it of noise, but whatever. It's a beautiful record by John Renborn. If you don't know, one of the great folk guitar players uh, is a member of the Pentangle. Where are we at here? Number 17. The Go-Betweens, Oceans Apart. Correct me if I'm wrong, feel free to. I think this is the last record they did together because uh, this man, Grant McLennan, a uh, year, year and a half after this record came out, passed away suddenly. Uh, this record, an original press came out in Yep Rock. Uh, it's the second record they did after they got back together. Um, Robert Forster and Graham McLennan got back together and started working together again, even though they remained friends after the band kind of split up and they did their own thing. But uh, yeah, this is this is a fantastic achievement by these guys, one of the great Australian pop groups. So this features some of my favorite songs in here: uh, "Boundary Rider," uh, "Darling Hurst Nights," uh, "Border Family," just incredible. 
Uh, I was lucky enough to see them on this tour. Uh, my wife and my brother and I, yeah, I got to see them on this tour. And thankfully, I'm so glad that I did because, as I said, like six months later after that show in Seattle, the Triple Door, uh, Greg McLennan passed away. So very, very uh, honored to have seen him before he died. Before he died. Uh, number 16. And some more recent addition to the library, The Who's Tommy. Uh, ticking up in value, this one at least, because it's an original UK press uh, with the take out of the sleeve here. Original UK press with this great laminated sleeve and this uh, lyric booklet includes some of the great artwork that you may be familiar with. At least I was familiar with with my, you know, original with a CD version that I had in one of the thick CD cases. Um, MCA release. Uh, yeah, you know the Who's Tommy first rock operas ever recorded. Still incredible. Still sounds really good, this record. I'm so stoked that I found this uh, as inexpensive as they did on Discogs. One of those lo lovely Discogs incidents where the person uh, marked the condition as far... They thought the condition was far worse than it actually is. It sounds much better than the condition that they listed it as. I'll just say that. I think I got the words out right. We'll see. I'll let you be the judge. Let's see. No, this is going in the wrong order now. See, the problem is, is I tried to do this video before, and my computer messed it all up. So I had to redo it, which is what I'm doing now on my iPad. So we are at number 15, halfway point, with Mass Attack's Mezzanine, uh, third album by this Bristol trip hop group, best known for. Uh, featuring the vocals of the amazing Elizabeth Fraser, the Cocteau Twins. Uh, apparently they wanted to get, they made sort of a dream list of the, the vocalists that they wanted to get on this record, including Susie Sue and some other folks, and Elizabeth was one of the only people that actually uh, responded positively to the idea. And uh, an original double LP release. Uh, this was a gift from a lovely friend of mine who used to know back in Astoria, Oregon, who uh, was in the computer programming world and had some work that took him uh, overseas to Germany, I think it was, very regularly. And so he got that for me as a birthday present. Because he's that kind of guy. They're both kind of obsessed with electronic music and trip hop at that time. 14 on the list. Stereolab Sound Dust. Um, one of my absolute all-time favorites by this band who, uh, I see we're just here in town here in Portland a few months, a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago great show um yeah i have almost everything this band has put out i'm still working on getting some singles and a couple of stray things that i don't own quite yet uh but this uh so good is they're getting it this is one of the records where they were starting to get into longer uh arrangement like like more complex arrangements that made the songs like twice as long as they usually were and really laying into grooves and laying out uh, atmosphere uh, fantastic record. I think the value of this one is uh, ticked up thanks to the um, packaging, which is this uh, thick um, press board release, I think is what this is called. Um, silk screen cover. So, yeah. I don't know how rare this is. I don't know. I feel like I see this one around every once in a while, but um, yeah, limited edition at least. And uh, I think it was a gift from an ex, uh, or at least you know, we were together at the time. She got it for me as a gift, I think, for Christmas, so thank you. You are responsible for one of the other ones on those lists, too, so sorry the relationship didn't work out, but we don't really need to get into that on this video. Uh, let's see here. We're at number 13, which is this classic power pop record, Matthew Sweet's Girlfriend. Um, the breakthrough record by the, the Georgia musician from 1991. Uh, he released a couple of other records on... Uh, a major label that really didn't go anywhere. They were decent enough, but this is the one where he finally just decided to dig into his love of Todd Rundgren and the Raspberries and uh, all the great power pop groups of the era and Fleetwood Mac and just go for it. And it's just it's such an incredible album. Uh, it's the one original Zoo release, Zoo Entertainment release that uh, the vinyl version is missing a couple songs that are on the that are on the CD and cassette versions when this came out. I think it's all the better for it, personally, but uh, 
they were restored to the record when um, the the Northwest, the Washington State label Intervention Records, re-released it uh, a few years ago. It was a double LP set with the songs tacked on there. Matthew Sweet. Who doesn't love Matthew Sweet? Do you love Matthew Sweet? I love Matthew Sweet. All right. Where are we at here? Number 12. There it is. Bud Powell, Jazz Giants. One of the great jazz musicians of our time. Uh, this is on Norman Granz's label, Norgran. Uh, supervised by Norman Granz, it says. Um, this was uh, another pretty recent pickup. Um, this is a reminder to uh, troll your favorite thrift stores in whatever town you live in because you never know what you're going to turn up, and this is what turned up there. Um, it's not like in crispy mint condition or anything like that but you know it's still you know an original pressing mono version of this jazz piano record and you know you can't go wrong with that strange the only one of two jazz records on this top 30 list i, I swore there was going to be more considering i have like most of the stuff back here is my jazz collection so go figure uh maybe i just don't have the valuable stuff yet we're at number 11 hitting the top 10 soon this is Digable Planets Reachin', the band's the first album uh, from 1993. Uh, great modern hip-hop record, uh, taking hip-hop in jazzier, stranger, psychedelic directions. Um, this is one that I picked up from a friend who was selling off a lot of his records, and he was selling off a lot of electronic and hip-hop stuff, and this one, like, my eyes bugged out when I saw this one, and I got a copy of The Low End Theory from him as well, the Charcoal Quest record. Okay, now we're into the top ten. Ready for the top ten? I'm ready for the top ten. T number ten, Minor Threat. Uh, the first album by the DC punk band. Uh, the red cover that back in the day would only cost you four bucks. Not so much anymore. Um, yeah, just one of the best hardcore punk bands. You call them hardcore? I think it's a hardcore punk band. That makes sense, right? Great hardcore punk band. Political Straight Edge, founder of Discord Records. So, so good. One of my favorite bands of all time. Uh, this one came to me uh, through a friend of a friend who was selling off their collection of records, both to sort of clear some space and to help deal with some medical expenses. So, um, bought a fair number of records for, from them just because I wanted to help and because we're getting great punk stuff and reggae stuff like this. So, of course, I was going to go for it. Number nine. Digable Planets, once more, with their second album. I think the only... I, think, I don't think they've done an album since. Correct me if I'm wrong, please, in the comments. But, blow out comb. A uh, huge leap forward from Reaching. Started to get into more, like, uh, soul and black exploitation soundtrack-inspired stuff on this record. Much more political on this album. Um... So, so good. This one is, you know, it's got the cutout hole, but whatever. It still is in immense, uh, immaculate condition still, even though I bought this, I don't know how many years ago, uh, on eBay for one of those dealers that uh, I won the auction. They didn't send any messages, any tracking numbers, nothing, and I was just like, am I actually going to get this record or not? I don't know. Sent them a couple of messages, figured I was going to write it off. I didn't pay, I think, that much for it, so it was okay. And then it just showed up in, like, a pretty sizable box, but the only thing in there, and it was tipped in its side with maybe a little newspaper underneath it, and I'm, I'm amazed that it survived the trip. So, happy that it survived the trip, because it's so good. You know this record? Please. You're a hip-hop fan, and you gotta go see, you know, Shabazz Palaces, or, you know, any of the Odd Future stuff, or you know, what Tyler, the Creator, has done. You're gonna love that one. All right. Number eight. This is another... A gift from a former lady friend of mine, former my ex, uh, Sonic Youth Stage Nation. I think she found this at a, uh, yeah, some vintage store that we were visiting. I was flipping through some of the records, like a gog and some of the stuff that they had there. And she was very thoughtful to remember what I was into and went back and got this and a couple other things for me as a birthday present. Um, but this is, yeah, the original Enigma Blast First release of this album uh, with the incredible Gerhard. Richter paintings on well this isn't a painting obviously this is the band but you know these are both these photorealistic paintings that he did of candles just astounding and this one of course comes with the 
hurriedly get this open for you. The Michael Levine photo poster. Yeah. You know this record, I'm sure, if you're a fan of alternative music, the grunge explosion, etc. Uh, so much of that alternative nation insanity would not have been possible were it not for Sonic Youth and the work that they did. And uh, Yeah. Long may they run. I hope they never get back together. I'll just say that. Number seven. This was a... Uh, this is a strange pickup for me, because uh, Power Lord, I'm a metal fan, but this is one that uh, I found, I think, at a thrift shop and didn't know what I was getting myself into. I was just like, well, look at this cover. This is either going to be amazing or it's going to be ridiculous, kind of like the Silver Apples record. Uh, thankfully, it's amazing. This is Oklahoma City uh, death metal. Really, really cool. Um, let me see when this was released, because I always forget that, that detail. Uh, oh, there it is, 1986. So very early, like, death thrash stuff. Really just phenomenal music on here. Um, yeah, a band I know very little about. I don't think they made any other records beyond this one. Uh, again, one of those things, like, yeah, troll thrift stores, folks, because you never know what will turn up. And, you know, this one, fairly valuable, as the video says. Okay, number six, almost in the top five. The Menace by Elastica, the second album by Elastica, this Britpop pop group, 1999, uh, as Justin Frischman taking the group into more danceable uh, electronic territory. Um, limited version of the record because it came with this wonderful poster. Uh, I think, like the artwork was um, conceived and I think helps stitched together by uh, the artist now known as M.I.A., who was a member of the Fold, I think a roadie for the band at the time. Um, really, really good record. I, uh, I love their first album more, but this is also underrated. That's what I'm looking for, is underrated. Top five time. Number five. The Sun album, White One. Uh, don't remember when this came out, uh, found this one used at Jackpot Records, uh, really, really, you know, if you know Sun, drony, trudging, doom metal, uh, this one's prominent for, uh, a wonderful, uh, spoken word piece by the great Julian Cope, is featured on here, and, uh, pressed on white vinyl, three sides of white vinyl, and then one side with this, uh, etching, on it, which you might be able to see there in the lights. Um, one of the better etching, laser etchings I've seen here. It's not like they just put the logo of the band on the record. It looks pretty great. Um, my friend uh, Nathan Carson thanked in the uh, liner notes for this one as I showed him this one time, and he said, oh, I'm, I'm thanked in the liner notes for that. And it's because when they were in the studio, I brought them a vaporizer. It's like, of course you did. All right, number four. The always incredible Loveless by My Bloody Valentine, the quintessential shoegaze record named very recently by Pitchfork as the best album of the 1990s. Full disclosure, I wrote a blurb for that album's list and contributed my uh, ballot to that as well. Um, yeah, this is a creation pressing that I bought uh, in the late 90s at uh, Ozone Records. Uh, I think I traded in some stuff. I was like, oh, I need to have this record, of course. And then it became super valuable. Not the... I still want to get the, the reissue, the analog reissue that uh, remaster that Kevin Shields undertook, but um, can't go wrong with that one. A masterpiece. Probably one of my top three albums of all time. I would say so. Speaking of top three, that's a rant. I'm just going to put these in my lap so I don't have to keep reaching down for them. Sorry about that. Getting a good set on my forehead. Number three. Radiohead's OK Computer. Do I need to say anything more about this record? I really don't think I do, because it's, you know, it's a classic. Classic of uh, British rock music, classic of a band uh, taking a huge creative leap forward after uh, two, you know, pretty great um, guitar pop records, guitar rock records, but uh, this was like totally another level and sent them into the stratosphere uh, success-wise, and uh, helped lead the direction of that would come next with Kid A and Amnesiac and beyond. Um, thank you to my friend Justin, my old bandmate, for kicking this down to me because 
he found out I was also a big Radiohead fan after I came to uh, band practice one day with number two on the list, Radiohead's The Bends, uh, which I found, yes, for 10 bucks at Jackpot Records. I used one, uh, the other added value of it is a promo copy of this one. Didn't realize that until very recently, honestly. I mean, I may have seen it, I just didn't, it didn't really sink in that that was something that I really, that was special about the record. That was like, oh, it's a promo record, whatever, but yeah. Um, yeah, still in great condition, even though I've had it for at least 15, 20 years. Um, yeah, incredible record. Yeah, Pablo Honey, good. This one, great. This one, Godhead. So, and then everything they've done since has been, you know, various levels of those three. We're on to number one. Reach the end of the list. This is Abdullah Dude's By Myself, a solo cello jazz record. Uh, I believe this is a private press release from 1977. Uh, the only release, at least on this label, Bishara Records. Uh, Abdullah Dude, really amazing jazz cellist who passed away probably two months ago, very, very recently. Uh, this one is one of those holy grail records I've been looking for for some time as a jazz listener and lover. And one popped up at a record store here in town, Tomorrow Records, and it wasn't cheap, I'll tell you that. Um, but it's, uh, you know, when those grails come across and you can afford it, you know, I, I had to do it. And so, uh, if you don't know this record, which I'm sure a lot of people don't, it's not very well known, but uh, go look this up on, I think it's on YouTube, I think it's on streaming services. Go give it a listen. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um, I can't get my friends into this one. I've tried. I've tried playing this for people, and they're like, it's fine. But I think when they think of jazz, they think of more, you know, the Bud Powell stuff, John Coltrane, the more, you know, rhythmic uh, music. But um, this one is just gorgeous, gorgeous music. Number one. The most valuable record, most valuable record in my collection. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching this. Hello to the vinyl community. I'm going to do this again, I hope. Maybe do it regularly. Um, if you live in the Portland area or visiting and are looking for some used records, uh, I sell uh, again at Crossroads and at a place called Memory Den on Southeast 2nd. Uh, look for the code RHA on all the records, on the stickers on the records. Or you could find me on Discogs as uh, The Ice Maiden, a reference to a uh, prefab Sprout song, one of my favorite bands. Um, or you can also find me on Whatnot. I just started selling there last week, trying to do that every Wednesday. Uh, Robert Ham has put for me there, selling all sorts of interesting stuff. And yeah, or follow me on Instagram at Picnic Lightning Records. I will leave that uh, in the description of this video so you can know where to find me. Thanks so much for watching. I appreciate your time, and we'll do this again.